how we interact in the workaday world, how we interact in church life. It does prepare a people for the second coming of Jesus. It does, in Paul's words, prepare a people without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, a community of God's people which will come unto a perfect man under the measure, the stature, the fullness of Christ. So obviously the time had not come during the 16th century Reformation for such an understanding of the gospel to be accomplished or to be understood. Now here's a question that a lot of people have as the first objection that they will throw up regarding the message of Jones and Wagner. They say, well, what about the failure of those two brethren? They failed to attain the high standard which they proclaimed. And it's true. But this fact in no way alters the truth of what Sister White said, that their message was the loud cry and the latter rain, the beginning of the loud cry and the latter rain. The difficulty is <clears throat> that they were not able to stand up against the bitter opposition that was presented to them because they never got beyond the beginning. And uh, I think that uh, you could compare it this way. You remember the manna that the Lord provided ancient Israel with out of the wilderness? That was their grocery store every day. And uh, when were they to gather it? Well, how many times did a week did it come down? Six times? They got enough for two days, didn't they? Sunday. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Did any come down on Sabbath? No. Okay. So then on Friday, the sixth day, what were they to do? All right, but what happened if, like on Monday, they gathered a double portion and tried to save that over until Tuesday? It would rot. Okay, it would spoil. But the mirror, it was a double miracle there because on Friday, when they gathered a double portion, that second portion was fresh on the seventh day of the week, although none came down. Now, of course, that was to teach them proper Sabbath observance, wasn't it? And uh, to eat and to, they, I guess they could make it into loaves and so forth and, and prepare it in a way that it would be uh, uh, palatable on the Sabbath day. All right, well, the truth is this, that that truth is like that. It, it's sweet to the taste when one is hungry and thirsty for it, correct? Yeah. But if one neglects it to the following day, the interest is lost, isn't it? Yeah. And if it continues to be neglected, if it's not eaten immediately, eventually it becomes rotten. And then people hate it. How many of you like, well, some people like to eat dead fish, rock fish. <laughs> okay, that's why you want sushi fresh fish. <laughs> well, manna, I understand, is just as bad the second day as rotten fish. You know, and that's the way tr truth can turn out to be for many people if it's not eaten immediately. And so this is what happened in our history. And unfortunately, we see the resistance to it even to this day, to this uh, most precious message. Moses' manna did this. Because Moses' manna did this, there's no reason to deny that it came down from heaven in the context of our history. It's not reasonable to demand perfection of either Jones and Wagner's message, nor of their own experience. Nonetheless, their message should be carefully investigated and accepted for its truth. And then we can get beyond the beginning. Had their message been allowed to develop as God intended, it would have brought deliverance from the root of sin. And we know that the root of sin is the love of self. And it follows that genuine and complete acceptance would have made a people ready for the coming of the Lord in that very generation. But this is no disparagement of the saints who are at rest to say that God intends his people to progress continually toward actually reaching a higher standard than any previous generation reached. 
nothing less than perfect likeness to Jesus in character, this experience is quite distinct from the justification by faith that's preached by the reformers. Hence it is that Sister White frequently was wont to describe the 1888 message as the message of Christ's righteousness, more than as justification by faith. Though she did occasionally use the latter term, Luther is wonderful and he pioneered the way, but Jones and Wagner went a lot further. So when we talk about the righteousness of Christ, that has a, a special significance to it, maybe even more so than justification by faith. The righteousness of Christ is his dikaiosune in the Greek. That's the Greek word, dikaiosune. And it means that Jesus took our humanity and he was tempted in all points like as we are. So if you're tempted to an addiction, and addictions come in all kinds of shapes and sizes and packages, <laughs> if you're tempted like I am, Jesus was tempted in all those points, just like you are. And it was a fearsome thing because he took our self-love. He took our taproot of sin, just like we have to struggle with. And so he not only had to deny them the specific addiction, say the cross of taking the vinegar, which would have been like anesthetizing himself with some alcohol for the pain. He said, no, I don't want to do that. Uh, I've never drank, drunk anything alcoholic in my life. I'm not going to do it now. I want my senses to be alive as possible so that faith can give a clear expression to my Father in heaven. He not only denied alcohol and cross, but he also denied the love of self. Because if he'd taken that alcohol, it would have been for himself to assuage his pain. Mm -hmm. So Jesus faced all these temptations and he said, no, this is what it means for Jesus as he overcame sin. That's the righteousness of Christ. He took from us what was crooked and he made it right. He straightened it out. So the righteousness of Christ comes from his, the humanity that he took, which is identical to ours. He came in the likeness of sinful flesh. So that phraseology explains more to us than Martin Luther's phrase of justification by faith. Although they are both one and the same, if you understand it rightly, in terms of the 1888 message. Justification by faith also means, in light of the cleansing of the sanctuary truth, a life that lives rightly by the righteousness of Christ, identifying with him. So Jones and Wagner discerned then the real significance of Babylon's fall. Uh, we often say that the popular churches gone on in the way the reformers began. If they'd gone on the way that the reformers began, they would never have fallen. But Jones and Wagner perceived that Babylon's theology on justification by faith was based ultimately on the basic love of self, and thus a fall was inevitable. <clears throat> Unfortunately, all too often, clergymen succumb to sin. And it's even worse, it puts an even worse black eye upon all Christians when it becomes public and the media gets a hold of it, because the media just loves to, you know, scour Christians, and if one of their own representatives falls into sin in a very public manner, this is a great way for them to discredit all of Christians, Christianity. And we've had that in the course of time, haven't we? We've seen uh, great evangel evangelists fall. And have you ever scratched your head and said, why in the world that they take folks, the likes of Jimmy Swagger, back into their ministries again and put them up in the pulpit with million dollar ministries again mm -hmm. when they fell. It's because of their understanding of the gospel. The gospel that Jimmy Swagger was proclaiming evidently was not powerful enough to keep him from falling. Who is the other one on the PTL network? He's been restored back to his ministry, hasn't he? Um, 
His name doesn't come to my mind right now. But I see him every morning when we turn on the, the cable. He's on there, you know. <laughs> Unfortunately, these kinds of things happen within the Adventist church too. And I would say by and large, it's because of a misunderstanding of the true gospel. Because if a pastor truly understands the most precious message, it will keep him from falling. If one understands the love that motivated Jesus on the cross to die for that pastor's sins, he will realize that he, above all people, is tempted to love himself because of the great influence that he has on others. And as you keep him humble. Yeah. I think when it comes to Jones and Wagner, uh, people are focused on Jones and Wagner and not on the message. Inevitably, that's the uh, objection that's raised. Uh, didn't Jones and Wagner fall? Yeah, they fell. Mm -hmm. but so I, that discredit by their fruit, you will know them. So that discredits them. Well, that's I'm also not their judge. It doesn't discredit the fact that it was manna from heaven. Yeah. And the manna was a miracle. Yeah. And Ellen White endorsed it mm -hmm. hundreds of times. And she even said that if they should fall away, it would not discredit the beginning of the latter rain and the law of pride that God manifested in their message. Amen. Unfortunately, they did fall, tragically. And it's a great hurdle for some people's minds to get over. But uh, the manna was nonetheless a miracle when it fell. And if it had been gobbled.